We started uh, this journey a few weeks ago, talking about renewal and recommitment, about the centrality of who we are, our identity wrapped up in the waters of baptism. And in that moment, God laid claim to our lives and set us on the path of discipleship to be Christ to the world, a path which leads us to sacrifice and to suffer for the sake of the world. As Sarah asked a couple of weeks ago, I'm not certain that's what we signed up for. To be intentional in entering the world for the sake of Christ. We are not here to find our own personal happiness. We're not here for what we get out of it. We are here to be inspired, which means literally to be in spirit, to be inspired through God's word, through our fellowship, that we may leave here and be Christ for the world. And today, as we conclude our renewal and recommitment piece, we come to a reading of Matthew, the 24th or 22nd chapter, where Jesus is again talking about what it means to be the kingdom. And so he says to his disciples, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. Well, the king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed the murderers, and burned their city. And he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. So those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. He said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. The gospel of our Lord, praise to you, O Christ. That's not a touchy-feely, warm, fuzzy reading. The king puts together a wedding banquet. He sends out an invitation. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit cordially invite you to the wedding of Christ and Christ's church. God uses the image of marriage throughout the entire Bible. Jesus refers to it several times. We see it at the very end of the book of Revelation when Christ descends as a bridegroom. So you have been invited to a wedding. We had a little bubbly as we walked in. We noticed the place is all decorated. The wedding candles are up. There are some boxes up in front that look an awful lot like gifts. Only guess what? Now we all know the song, don't we? So if you know it, you can sing it along with me. 
I cannot come to the banquet, don't bother me now. I have married me a wife, I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold, oh no, I cannot come. Now, as kids, of course, we used to flip-flop those. I have married me a cow, and I have bought me a wife. Remember that? You don't know that song? Well, you guys grew up in the abyss of poverty. <laughs> People were too busy to come to the banquet. So the king goes out, and he sends more to say, hey, you have been invited. Come on, the feast is ready. And when they said no again, the master got a little ticked off. He murdered them, destroyed their city, and said, go out and find others, because obviously these folks are not worthy. I had a friend I worked with in one of my stints in therapy sessions. And he was a rather intriguing fellow. He, um, he called himself an agnostic Jew. And I said, that's okay, I know a lot of agnostic Lutherans. He was Jewish by virtue of birth, but he really didn't participate in any of the temple activities. He, said he would go on occasion with his mother to some of the high holy days, but that was really about it. What was amazing about him was that even though he called himself an agnostic Jew, as he was counseling families, he would use biblical stories. So he would be dealing with a family where there was a tremendous amount of civil, uh, civil rivalry, and, and so he would say, well, tell me the story of Jacob and Esau. And the family would inevitably look at him and say, we don't know the story of Jacob and Esau. We don't even know who they are. He says, well, they're biblical characters. They were brothers. And they had some problems. But he says, it's not even important that you know the story. Just, just go ahead and tell it in, in your own way. And it was amazing how many times the biblical story and the narrative of this family matched. As brothers and sisters would see each other as envious and jealous of one another, believing that the parent, you know, favored one over the other. If it was an issue of, of, of adultery, he would say, tell me the story of, of David and Bathsheba. They'd say, we don't know any David or Bathsheba. He said, that's okay, make it up. And they would talk about deceit and dishonesty and envy and coveting. When he got to the very end of the very first session with a family, he would ask them, what are you willing to do to find healing and peace in your family? And inevitably they would say, oh, we're willing to do anything. He'd say, okay. So he'd pull out a chair. And he'd put the chair right in the middle of the room. And he would identify who the one in the family was who held all the power. We all know those people in our own families, don't we? The person in the family that holds all the power, the ones around whom the rest of us must dance. And he would say to that one, I want you to come and stand up in this chair. And the person would look at him and go, who, me? And say, yeah, you, come and stand up in this chair. And they would kind of, you know, laugh, that nervous sort of laugh, not knowing if this person was, was serious or not serious, kind of going, oh, I'm not going to do that. That, you know, I might get hurt. I might stand up and fall off, for heaven's sakes. And after this had gone on for a few moments, the therapist would say, a few minutes ago, you told me you were willing to do anything. And when I ask you to do something as simple as stand up in a chair, you won't even do that. So how in the world are you going to do the difficult things that I'm going to ask of you?
I've thought about that over the years. We do the easy things pretty well. You see, well, you may not know it, but you have already RSVP'd to the wedding banquet. You've already done that. Every person in this room over the age of about 12 has already RSVP'd. You already said, I'm going to be there. You did it when you stood up in front of this congregation or you stood in front of another congregation and you promised. You promised to continue to live in the covenant that God made with you in holy baptism. To live among God's faithful people. To hear his word, share in his supper, to strive for peace and justice in all of the world. And then you said, I will and I ask God to help and guide me. That's all this commitment card is. That's all it is. It is the vows that you have already made. Now we've made it easy for you. We broke it down into worship, faith formation, and being involved in outreach. It's the commitment you've already made. We're asking you to recommit. To renew your commitment to continue this journey, to live among God's faithful people, to hear his word, share in his supper, and to strive for justice and peace in all of the world. And in a moment, I'm going to be asking you to bring these up. Now, I know some of you put them in the offering boxes already. But if you don't have one, they're being handed out right now. Now, I want to share something with you. You see, this is already working. It's already working. Because of this congregation's generosity, this is already working. If you'd have been here yesterday morning early, You'd have seen people loading boxes full of quilts and medical supplies and school supplies to be shipped out all over the world. Because of this congregation's generosity and our work with the Sojourner House, never again will a homeless person in Eau Claire ever have to sleep under a bridge on a cold winter's night but rather they'll be able to sleep in a place where they're treated with dignity, where they have an opportunity for a warm meal, for fellowship, and for the assistance that they will need to take that next step in their life. You see, it's already working. We're already striving for justice and peace. Because of your generosity last week, with the money that you put in the blessing box. And I invite you to do that again today. Don't walk out of here with that dollar in your pocket. But because of your generosity, I was able this past week to say to a young lady with two children whose husband has left her years ago, who's been mired in poverty, who has one more obstacle to overcome. I don't know if you're aware of it, but they put a tremendous number of obstacles in the way of poor people. She has one more obstacle to overcome that will make her eligible to enter into a job retraining program that will give her the skills that she needs in order to have a job which will sustain her and her family. But she needed $175 for this class. And because of your generosity last Sunday, I was able to say to this woman, yes. You see, it's already working. Did you know that contrary to what you see on the 24-hour news programs of the constant violence across our world, in fact, violence has been declining at an accelerated rate. Crime in this nation is down. Crimes of violence are way down. 
And one of the primary reasons for that is because we as a congregation stood up and informed the community about issues like bullying. So it's already working. But we need to keep working. We need to keep striving for justice and peace throughout all of the world. And so we're asking you to recommit. I don't care if you've been here for 50 years or five minutes. Help us make that difference. Help us to continue to strive for peace and justice in all of the world. It was easy to stand in front of a congregation and say, I will, and I ask God to help and guide me. It's a little harder to actually do it. It was easy for that family to stand there and say, oh, we're willing to do anything, but in actually doing anything is a whole other story. So this is your opportunity. This past week, a man who truly did change the world passed away at the age of 56. He was a man who literally did change the world. Many of the events that happened in Tunisia and Egypt and all across the Arab world happened because this man gave us tools that, able, that enabled us to get around government censorship and around government restrictions and get the word out to the world. And this man had a lot of rather remarkable things to say. One of those things he said had to do with the issue of the crazy people in the world. He said the crazy visionaries in the world are people everybody wants to laugh off, but you know what? You can't ignore them because the truth is these people who refuse to follow the rules, who refuse to live inside of the box, he said these are the only people who have ever changed the world. But there was a quote he made while uh, giving the commencement speech at Stanford University where he said, remembering that you are going to die is the best way I know of avoiding the trap of believing you have something to lose. I shared with you last week, we only get to rent this stuff. It's not ours. And at some point in our journey, we're going to be in this box saying, express delivery, return to sender. So you have nothing to lose. You do, however, have a tremendous amount to gain. Clothe yourselves in righteousness. Come to the wedding banquet. Send in your RSVP. And be a part of this marvelous little army that seeks peace and justice in all the world. Amen.